Good morning, everyone, and welcome back for the second day of the seminar. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the gala dinner that we uh, had last night, if you had the chance to attend. And I'm going to share something uh, that might sound a bit trivial about last night. When the gala dinner ended, I went outside of the Parador uh, to, take a, to take a walk. And then I realized that there's a, an overlooked benefit of small cities that you just can get in big cities. And that is that in small cities, you can see the stars. <laughs> so um, I'm going to share with you a couple of housekeeping things uh, about today. Uh, the first thing is that uh, there's going to be a shuttle bus uh, service available at 2 p.m. when we finish the sessions today. And uh, it's important that we finish uh, at 2 p.m. sharp uh, because uh, otherwise you will not, we will not be able to, to use the shuttle service as they have to go. The other thing is that uh, today we're going to have like a, um, we're going to have a, um, a participation and intervention in Italian. So maybe you might consider taking the translation receiver in case you don't understand the Italian. And um, and yeah, the sessions uh, will end at uh, 1 p.m. and at 1 p.m. Uh, we will uh, start uh, the lunch. And now we're gonna let uh, we're gonna dive into the first session of the day which is the second uh, Talent uh, City session. Uh, this time uh, it's going to focus on governance and public services. Our speakers will discuss the complexities of multi-level governance. And I am pleased to introduce uh, Eloy Cuellar, the Deputy Director at the General Secretary of Demographic uh, Challenge at the Ministry of Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge. Eloy will be our moderator for this session, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, bueno, pues es un placer estar aquí. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here when we're trying to uh, conduct this session within the time limit. And uh, therefore, each of the speakers will have 10 minutes. And uh, well, again, a warm welcome to you all. We will be focusing on those territories with uh, talent. It is so difficult to have the necessary conditions in one territory so that we can support productive uh, dynamics and those dynamics that can favor development. In the course of the Spanish presidency of the European Union, we are making a special emphasis in small towns and middle-sized, medium-sized cities and towns as the places where we can uh, conduct a kind of activity to cohesion at the territory and uh, end inequalities. This is interesting indeed, and we are putting the focus on three concepts. I was speaking to my general director just a while ago about how we have been able to produce public policies and doing so in a cross-cutting manner. And this is related to the fact that the territories must be active, inclusive and functional. Active insofar as they need to be capable of generating dynamics to uh, push forward development. They need to be inclusive insofar as they will need to attract talent and incorporate those capacities that are present and that should uh, emerge. And let me quote someone called Steve Berlin, who just released a publication uh, called emerging systems and who discusses the relationships between arms uh, holds and uh, the territories, how these uh, are organized very similarly indeed. And uh, then they need to be functional. As I said, these has to be territories able to expanding the vital possibilities of the citizens and the citizenship living in those territories and those vital possibilities both at the individual and at the collective levels. And we will be focusing, therefore, in this session on the importance of something which is co-substantial to the human being. 
And that's how we organize ourselves and how we govern ourselves, multi-level governance. Somebody says that the more organizations there are in a territory, the more pacts and alliances we will need and the better public policies you will find. However, there are others who think that having too many stakeholders in one given territory, the only thing that can give rise uh, is just uh, conflict and uh, hurdles in public pol policies. From the Spanish uh, presidency's perspective, we wanted to set a goal to govern and do everything at the service of inclusivity. And we thought about uh, doing it in uh, two ways, by public-private partnerships. It is clear that for a territory to be active and inclusive and functional, it is necessary to have the participation of all stakeholders. The critical mass is absolutely fundamental for territories. And to enable the participation of all actors, we need to make an effort so that all energies in a given territory are at the service of a common project, at the service of the community. These energies in a given territory can be mobilized through PPPs and also through the public and social cooperation. We understand PPPs as uh, trying to make uh, economic agents uh, take part, and the public public and public social uh, partnership is about not leaving behind those uh, stakeholders that can uh, generate that critical mass, and as well as those public organizations, which uh, with the coordination can actually uh, contribute to this goal. So I don't want to take any more time off the speakers. So we're going to be hearing very interesting uh, interventions and we're running short of time. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the people who are with us uh, today. We have Jan Eloy, who will talk about Small Places Matter. There's a uh, action plan. Micro is important for us and for this uh, uh, talk. We will also hear from Erika Jaraid. She is a professor from University of Santiago de Compostela who will be presenting the main conclusions on governance systems and she will tell us uh, about some specific experiences she's gathered, which I hope will be very enlightening. We also have Marcos Ross. Sorry, we have Marco Del Fiore coming from the University of Turin. He will be speaking in Italian today. This is a specifically beautiful language to hear. Marco will also be with us, and I think we just uh, start with Jan. Jan, you have nine minutes to share your views with us. Thank you. Thank you to you. I use this. I have a press there. there. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you, Espon, for inviting me for this. Um, I was also here yesterday. So before I start on the small places, I got a message from my friends and people in Gaza that uh, they wanted me to echo and second the, the mayor of, uh, of um, uh, Soria from yesterday, that uh, no, all atrocities must stop against the people of Gaza. I happen to have been working in Gaza, so I know what I'm talking about. So, okay, aside, thank you. Um, the Small Places Matter is a pilot action that we did uh, under, the, uh, under the framework of the Territorial Agenda 2030. Uh, I will be very short. I show you some, present, some uh, slides and I will try to just... Huh? Thank, you. Uh, Thank you. And... Um, if I know how to go further with this, yes. 
What I want to discuss, tell you about the small places matter is where we are, where we, where we started and where we, where we are uh, and where we are trying to head in the, in the future. But let me say that the pilot action uh, on small places matter, we have done a lot to engage and to try to link it up with the rural vision in uh, Europe that we heard about yesterday. So the small places matter is a part of also the actions coming up from smart villages uh, and the rural vision we, not, we, we, we heard about yesterday. So uh, have that in mind and also for how we will continue this kind of work in the future. The, the picture you see is a small place in Norway, in the west coast, in the, in the longest fjord in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the world called Sognefjord. This is Songdal. The Small Places Matter territorial agenda uh, was a kind of a, a kind of a pilot action that was not a kind, was not a research uh, ha happening. It was it was a a a, um, a, a uh, an exercise with uh, with partners from different countries. From Norway, we coordinated it from Norway. We had people from Ireland, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, and the DG Regio and DG, DG Agri. And um, what we were wanted to, 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 to achieve was to see how small places could, in a way, be a kind of uh, entity that could help boost the development and the, in, the, in the closer territory where they are. And how, how different approaches to this uh, is seen in different countries. So I, I go to the next. In the, the pilot partners, we had, um, we had the capacity, uh, we had the supporting, uh, each of the partners had some uh, focus on specific issues. And in the German case, we heard about yesterday, Small Town Academy was also, uh, is also in this report. And um, we, in Ireland, we, fo we focused on the Town Center First framework. It's a, it's a, it's a, kind, of, uh, it's a kind of institution they have in, in, in Ireland. We, you can see the similarities of all these. So, you can continue with the, with the, with the Polish uh, uh, program for local development. And in Norway, we are participating both in cross-border cooperation with Sweden, and we also have a, a competence center for regional development that is uh, owned by the state. In, uh, in Sweden, 10 municipalities are cooperating uh, and so forth. And in Switzerland, we linked it up to the pilot action on uh, climate change in Alpine towns. We also had a lot of, I, I mentioned already the rural vision, but also thanks to ESPON, all the data and analysis on the role of the small places we have been uh, feeding into this study. And uh, we have uh, worked a lot on, uh, on, uh, on those. So thank you for ESPON co uh, contribution. Uh, we, uh, let me have it. If you thank you. <laughs> if we if we look at uh, some of these, uh, um, this is more in detail what's going on in 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 all the uh, different countries. I will not go into that now. We have no time for that. But I, I in the, in the end I will show you the the, the homepage or for the for the report where you can go into detail and learn from different different um, uh, uh, different empirical evidence here. So, um, uh, it, it is, and here are some, some uh, examples from Scandinavian mountains, from Germany, capacity building, and capacity building has been, become one of the main issues out of this study, and what we do in, in Norway also. I will not go in detail on this. 
this pilot action has actually identified tools and steps to, to help small places build capacity and better integrate and involve small places in territorial development. And we have focused on strategic planning, we have focused on domestic planning, information and analysis, uh, intermunicipal linking, uh, cross-border cooperation, which is very important. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we, I think we were the first in Europe that in, uh, encouraged uh, to have the Territorial Agenda 2030 as part of the programming of the cross-border program between Sweden and Norway. That's very important. And it should be more of that in the future. Um, I, 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 the time is okay? We still have some minutes? Uh, yes, four minutes. Four minutes. I'm, I'm very scared about the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let me, yeah, thank you. Much better, I don't like this. Um, let me, let me come to some of the conclusions we, and takeaways we made from this study, uh, which are, is, is a lot, but some of them mentioned here. Um, first of all, small places do matter. Don't forget that. When we leave uh, Cuenca today, we should have one thing with us, small places matter. And that's the main conclusion. And then we can discuss how it can matter more in, in the future. Um, we also focused on the value of territorial place-based approach, which we have been talking about yesterday and we will be talking more about today. And, and th this is also addressed in, 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 in our report. But the main thing is the capacity building, not a surprise, but capacity building is the key. It's the first step of capacity building must have a priority in the small places, which we also, that is some takeaway we have from, from, uh, from the academy in Germany, the small, the small town academy in Germany, the, uh, the, the institutions in Norway and in, in Ireland, we see that capacity is, is number one. And then we have a lot of focus on territorial cooperation that adds value to, to the work and development of small places. And then link across uh, initiatives. So what I also mentioned, that the tools we, we are focusing on is uh, strategy and, uh, and uh, data and insight formulation and prioritization and delivery. And then we, in, I will fi finalize very soon. Uh, when I we had a, an event in Brussels during the European Week of Regions and Cities 2023 in Brussels this year in October, where we merged with a uh, activity on smart villages. That was very a learning process and we learned a lot of each other, the small places approach and the smart, smart villages approach. And we discussed together and, and people found each other and, and I think we have some, uh, some encouraging possibilities for future cooperation among these two approaches. Uh, we discussed on this policy lab. And one of them is, is, is about the smart village journey. We learned about this uh, smart rural 21 and smart rural 27, that is a European Union initiatives, and uh, which is coinciding with the, with the territorial agenda and the smart villages we are, we are working on. So we are, we are very encouraged to do more about the, the, this linkage. I will not go in detail on that now. But uh, the smart rural is very, very good. And um, this is my last slide. Next. Uh, and this is not, it's not the idea that you should read this. This is the homepage of the, the, the territorial agenda 
where you will find the final report of the Small Places Matter, and you can download it there and read it. Yeah, and you go to sleep before you go to sleep. <laughs> and uh, so, thank you. I do. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> more or less. No, more I or less. More or less. <laughs> Okay, we'll continue with the next speaker, Erika Jaray. But before that, and just reflecting on the words of Professor Edoy, he mentioned planning, and this is a concept that also came up yesterday. It was the mayor of Soria who spoke about planning, about strategic planning, which is just a link between knowledge and action in the public sphere. And just to think about how closely related this is with governance centers, uh, to the point that even in the general direct directorate led by Juana Lopez, there is a deputy general directorate devoted to knowledge and another one devoted to action, which is the one I belong to. So for me, it is particularly interesting to be part of a forum where you can link and be part of this uh, action planning. And uh, just talking about scientists and female scientists, Erika will tell us more about the findings that can be worked on with regard to this governance between middle-sized towns and cities and how that relationship can be more productive. Well, thank you very much, Eloy. I will try to fit to the, <laughs> to the time. We are all scared today, I think, <laughs> to be... Okay, I switched to Spanish because I feel more, more comfortable. Um, bueno, desde los orígenes de la Unión Europea, Set from the very origins of the European Union, member states have been aware of the importance of cohesion policies, the social territorial cohesion policies. Literally, in order to reduce differences between and across the different regions and to support those which are less favored. And from the creation of the DG region, our work has been constant. We've had very many initiatives, but despite the extraordinary financial effort and the design of public policies, we still perceive important differences across the EU territories. These are calculated on income per capita, but the differences go far beyond that and have a direct effect on the quality of life of, in, of inhabitants. These uh, unbalances do not have one single origin or explanation, but rather they are due to multiple factors. But it is true that there is a rich Europe and a poor Europe. There is a rich Spain and a poor Spain. And the natural tendency is for people to seek those spaces where there is the wealth. And those spaces are generally larger cities. This has led to the fact that really Today, 40.2% of European people live in big cities. In Spain, it is 48%, 28 uh, in rural, 32 in rural areas, and intermediate uh, or middle-sized cities. But the trend is for cities to grow larger, and we believe that by 2050, 70% of the people will live in big cities. This concentration of the population in large cities is related to some of the issues we try to tackle today, such as pollution, the increase of imbalances, and the uh, diminishing quality of life linked to another fundamental problem, which is the abandonment of the territory, which generates and gives rise to environmental issues. It increases the risk or the hazard of fires, and it has many other consequences. In Spain, around 61.5% of towns have less than 1,000 inhabitants, and the abandonment of those rural areas is constant which leads to what we call España vacía, the emptied or hollowed Spain. But whether it is empty or hollowed, we are referring not just to 
a, a nature, but rather an action, an action that has led to that effect. And we need to watch this closely because public policies are about what you do and what you do not do. Today, while we vote a new government in, in our parliament, I can truly say that that emptying of Spain or fighting, fighting against that emptying of Spain requires emerging uh, public policies. The root of these inequalities is in the territorial design. The population grows around the more productive areas while they leave behind those rural areas fighting against this process we have the middle-sized cities as the key players they are not just an option they are a need they are an alternative to living in big cities and they are the best alternatives to preserve our current uh, models of living and i would like to add something more i think it is a right of the forthcoming generations for us to keep them uh, to keep these middle-sized cities because they promote uh, social cohesion and they favor the relationships between the rural and the urban and they also contribute fighting depopulation and the abandonment of territories small and medium-sized cities allow for exchanges and human relationships much better than big cities do because they do not lose the capacity to interlink people just now let me refer to this study that we carried out uh, which was commissioned by the government of spain and espon most of the middle-sized cities in spain are located around larger cities because as i said citizens want to enjoy the wealth uh, production models and the way of living of middle-sized cities, which is also very valuable to them. And that's why the areas along the coastline in our country are also being filled with middle-sized cities, whereas in the inner cities, larger uh, cities are, is where the wealth is, people tend to prefer middle-sized cities. However, in the interior, in the inner Spain, we don't see very many middle-sized cities. So location is absolutely fundamental. Some cities, some middle-sized cities in given geographical areas have an average income per person or per uh, home which are specifically low. However, those around larger cities such as Madrid or Barcelona and middle-sized cities in the north of Spain have higher incomes typically. We can see this in the maps. Small and middle-sized middle cities are suffering, in the north of Spain, are suffering from an aging population coinciding with those areas where there is not a lot of immigration and the influence of employment in small and middle-sized cities is not homogeneous. So the south and southeast of the country are the areas with the highest rate of unemployment. The work we carried out comes to show that it is actually establishing services and infrastructures that relates the growing of middle-sized cities. This is a phenomenon that will grow with the expansion of the digital era. Besides, the analysis of public policies shows that there are there is a scarcity of references to programs mentioning and including specifically small and middle-sized cities. Cities. However, the uh, participation of the government of Spain is growing uh, by the explicit reference to the multi-regional operation program for the period 2027, the sustainable development strategy and the plans carried out by the Ministry of um, demographic challenge, such as Plan 130 of this very seminar. The Spanish administration requires for many of the competencies to provide basic services to the citizens, such as healthcare and education and employment promotion, actually fall uh, within the responsibility of the regional governments. That is why cooperation between the different uh, governments and administrations at all uh, levels is absolutely fundamental. Policies must go from the national scope, as we saw with the success of the digitalization policy in Spain, to the local sphere. 
working in the territories themselves, but the territorial cohesion policies cannot be static. However, they need to continue to innovate and adapt to changes in society. As part of our study, we analyzed the policies uh, carried out in recent years in the city of Mérida, which is a success story, uh, different from the case of many other uh, cities. Mérida is a middle-sized city uh, in the region of Extremadura. It is the capital city of that uh, autonomous region, and it is also considered a uh, World Heritage Site. Merida has been growing in the numbers in the population, particularly from the year 2000, and now has around 60,000 inhabitants in 2022. In the last 20 years, the increase of population in Merida is significantly higher than the average mean. It is also the city in Extremadura with the largest number of floating population, and it shows a trend towards a, an aged population. However, its aging rate is a lot lower than the average in Spain. How can we explain this uh, population growth, despite the fact of being located in one of the poorest regions of Spain? Well, again, the explanation is owes to different factors, and let's just have a look at some of these factors. Tourism is the economic activity that's more important, most important in Merida due to its uh, historic uh, an artistic heritage, the uh, expenditure by tourists and per day is higher than the average for the region. But also the difference is that the fact that Merida has made tourism a, an attraction point. They have developed a model where the tourist becomes part of the life of the city. For instance, the uh, theater festival, which is really well known, and which attracts not only spectators, but also uh, theater companies, critics, actors, etc. And this is part of the city of Merida, such as the Roman constructions. It is a tourism, a kind of tourism that participates in the development of the city. Merida can be interpreted and understood as a construction, a co uh, cooperative construction of those people living in Merida and the ones who come to Merida. And, uh, this exchange of roles provides for an alternative type of uh, tourism that has become an institution in Merida. Another one of the strengths in Merida is its capacity to attract European funds. Merida is uh, outside of the standard in this regard. And it has been this uh, number two and number one in the last two years when it comes to obtaining uh, European funds. We have to highlight other things, such as the commitment of the uh, town hall with the uh, social cohesion, and uh, they also bear on sustainability, connectivity, and uh, accessibility. And they want to achieve this 15-minute uh, city model that was repeated yesterday quite often, um, and uh, the actors that we've been interviewing, also supported by, by a good public services offer, also for area. Uh, some, I, I've been asked to mention some of the recommendations regarding the policies that we have included in our report. I know that we are very tight on time. Um, I would like just to highlight one of these recommendations. I believe that it is key to establish a statewide map of SMSTCs in order to identify which are the cities that we call intermediate and which ones we want to foster. This map needs to be uh, uh, needs to have uh, a series of criteria that define the intermediate cities in terms of the number of inhabitants their dependence on the larger cities, uh, their influence on smaller urban centers, and the volume of 
services they provide or the distance that separates them from other cities. The reason is that after the research carried out, we have found that in Spain, in many cases, the threshold for uh, qualifying a city as intermediate city should be below 20,000 inhabitants. And I would even dare to say that we could go as far as to saying that the cut would be at 10,000 inhabitants. I will not uh, elaborate on the rest of our policy recommendations. You can uh, check them out in the report when the report is published. But I would like to finish this presentation by uh, sharing some reflections with you. Allow me to say, as the candidate to the presidency in Spain, I quote Antonio Machado, because there is a social and spatial fragmentation in the country today, today is always still now, because the intermediate cities have been the ones who, that have received the major growth in the cities around Spain, and they, are been, they have been key in the articulation of the country. I will not deny that there are many challenges ahead, but I would like to believe, looking forward, that today is still... Uh, You can see these comments are very interesting, the conclusions are very interesting, and we are really looking forward to reading the report. I would like to highlight two key points. First of all, the complexity that is inherent to all the cases that we have been discussing, and also the factors that we need to pay attention to. But there is a scarcity of public resources, and we need to decide what are the keys in the piano that we need to tap on in order to get some tune. So we need to promote tourism, but it's not a gentrified type of tourism, but a different a model of tourism that has also contributed to the development up until now. We will now go in depth in the SMSTCs and we I'll leave the floor to Marco del Fiore, who will be speaking in English and presenting the case of his uh, city. Thank you, Marco, for his words. Good morning, everyone. Yes, I will speak in English for the happiness of the translator. Um, before the beginning of my intervention, I would like to thank the ESPON GTC and the Spanish presidency for giving me the opportunity to participate and uh, contribute to this session. My presentation, as already introduced, focuses on the multi-level governance of small and medium cities in Italian context with the case studies of the city of Saluzzo. Starting from the question which size and role for the Italian small and medium-sized towns and city, we have to consider that in the past decades, the Italian debate on local and regional development has been mainly polarized by the two main themes. On the one hand, the mainstream attention has been uh, devoted to the major metropolitan areas, and on the other hand, a growing debate on inner areas and marginalized place has taken place. Within this frame, as you can see in the framework, uh, the topic of small and medium-sized cities show fault in the middle, despite the high number of population living in this type of settlement. Um, no specific attention can be detected in the academic and the cultural debate, as well as no specific policies for small and medium-sized cities in the Italian national context, except in some specific regional policies such as Lombardia, as you can see after me, the intervention of the other Italian colleague, and the Campania region. But despite this absence, in Italy, there are other numerous national policies that indirectly concern small and medium-sized cities. In the general national context of a progressive decline of wide area policies, is emerging an important phase of experimentation with innovative territorial policies, 
capable of interpreting the territory with a relational dimension. First of all, the national strategies for inner area that formulates the relationship between territory on the subject of services. The national strategies for green community that propose a new link between ecological interaction within urban and natural region. The leader approach and legs as potential location for development strategies. And as you can see in the maps, is the national policy that mostly interacts in Italy with the small and medium cities represented here in orange, if you can see. But also the leader approach and lags in Italy still today underexploited as they are managed as a monofound system. The, in general, uh, the instrument and policy in Italy that can involve small and medium sized towns and cities, either directly or indirectly, happen with a complex multi level governance framework in which national, regional, and local uh, level plays important roles. For this reason, and to the better understand the dynamics related to multi-level governance, we have examined the local case studies of the city of Saluzzo and the Monviso territory. The city is located in the northwest Italy, in the Piedmont region, not far from the border with uh, France. And due to its strategic location uh, and the strong historical uh, identity and significance, the city of Saluzzo plays a significant role in the broader territory. And its choice as a case study uh, is particularly relevant because it combines a double sides analysis, a municipal dimension of almost 20,000 inhabitants, at the same time a gravitational role of about four times its size, with a territory that is mostly characterized by mountain valleys, but with a strong social, cultural, and functional interrelation. In the territory, the general economic wealth coexists with important social demographic challenges. The decline in housing and the socio-economic condition in the mountainous area, combined with the concentration of the population in the foothills, as you can see in the map, present a multifaceted situation, in particular relevant to the service accessibility across different areas within the Monviso region. But despite this, over the uh, past eight years, the city of Saluzzo has raised almost 47 million euros in public funding, demonstrating the ability to reach a critical territorial mass sufficient to ensure the effectiveness of local development strategies. The territory stands out thanks to the territorial cooperation. The city of Saluzzo and the Monviso region have been actively working in recent years to construct a new and revitalized territorial identity. Numerous projects streaming from European, national, and local initiative um, streaming converge in the area. And among these, the transboundary project linked to the Interregal Cotra program, the Experimental Green Community project, the lag that is now in the proximity of the city, but with the hypothesis of extending in a new programming period, and the proximity of the area recognized by the national strategies for in the area. To sum up, also for the Italian, we have to develop the sub policy recommendation. And from the analysis of the national and local context, um, the most important uh, policy recommendation are here summarized. First of all, the policies direct to small and medium sized town and city should address the critical issue in the relationship between urban and rural areas to establish a territorial critical mass capable of ensuring the effectiveness of local development strategies. Then the small and medium sized towns and cities should also develop themselves a shared strategic vision and strong political leadership capable of directing the policies of a territory as demonstrated by the case study of Saluzzo and national and regional policies should be able to create the condition in which local policies can constitute functional areas in which the small and medium-sized cities are considered as the pivotal role for a larger area. To conclude, a provocative suggestion, especially for countries that have not yet implemented it, like Italy, 
Why don't you use already established European tools, such as the CLLD, the community-led local development, using a plurifound system in order to overcome the urban-rural divide? Thank you for the attention. Muchísimas gracias, Marco. Un interesante concepto, el de masa crítica, que es un Thank concepto que viene concepts. de la física, pero que mass, yo cada uh, vez lo escucho, lo escucho from más porque physics, parece muy necesario. I Nosotros lo empleamos hear en more and more often because it seems necessary. We use it in the um, general secretariat when uh, Fran. Paco Boya uh, is pushing us to promote the development of the territories. He's very much concerned about the critical mass aspects. And the Secretary General said to us that the counties can really create this critical mass beyond the critical mass that the little towns can create by themselves. And we're going to move on to the political reflections where we're going to be discussing the importance of the SMSTCs. Due to the time constraints, we're going to prioritize and we're going to be listening uh, to Isabel Ferreira. She is the Secretary General, Secretary of State for Regional Development in Portugal. We are going to try to establish the connection with Isabel and uh, have her as our first participant to tell us their case about the cross-border development. I know I don't know if we can have her online already. Here we have her. Good morning, Isabel. Welcome. The floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much for this opportunity and congratulations uh, for the organization of this, of this event. And um, I, I will take this opportunity to share with all of you uh, our common strategy for cross-border development, which is a, a pioneer strategy within the European Union. Um, and uh, I am the responsible in the government, in the Portuguese government for this strategy. And I have been, and I have been working with Paco Boya in this, in this common strategy. Um, on the Portuguese side, uh, the common strategy for cross-border development includes uh, 145 municipalities. Uh, more than 1,500 uh, parishes uh, and 1.6 million uh, inhabitants. And it, it integrates 62% uh, of uh, Portugal's surface. Uh, on, the, on the Spanish side, it includes uh, 1,231 municipalities. Uh, uh, and uh, 3.3 million inhabitants. And it, it integrates uh, all the municipalities uh, on the border provinces, such as Badajoz, Cáceres, Huelva, Ourense, Pontevedra, Salamanca, and Zamora. Uh, and uh, covers 70% uh, of Spain's surface. This, this common strategy is focused on five different axes, uh, one related to mobility, safety, and elim elimination of context costs, another one related with the infrastructure and territorial connectivity, the third one is related with joint management uh, and sharing services, Another one uh, devoted to economic uh, development and territorial innovation. And the last one dedicated to environment, energy, urban centers uh, and cultures. Within this, uh, within this common strategy, we have the opportunity to develop uh, uh, different common measures between Portugal and Spain 
for instance, the practical guide for Spanish Portuguese board worker, uh, which is a document uh, that gathers useful information uh, on all topics relevant um, to the implementation and streamlining of labor dynamic with a view to facilitating movement and access to information and workers' rights, mainly in what concerns employment and professional training, recognition of professional qualifications, working conditions, including safety and professional health, uh, medical assistance conditions, support in case of temporary disability, social security rights, uh, including maternity, paternity and retirement. Uh, another measure that we, ha that we had developed together uh, is the cross-border uh, 112 implemented in the north of Portugal and Galiza cooperation area. Uh, and the cooperation protocol uh, for the operationalization of urgent medical assistance, uh, like management of emergency calls, uh, extra hospital assistance, and response to accidents with multiple injuries. It is between Galicia and the northern region of Portugal, and it was signed on December uh, 14, uh, 2022. And similar protocols are being prepared to extend this measure to the region of Castilia, uh, Castilia and Leon and the central region and uh, subsequently to the remaining uh, cross-border regions in a, in a phased manner. Uh, another common project is uh, the single document for minors, minor circulation. Um, which is a measure that migrated for the, the Spanish presidents. Uh, but I would also like to highlight uh, our common uh, efforts to develop innovation ecosystems. Uh, we signed a common memorandum uh, in the last Luso-Spanish summit. Uh, we have created the Iberian Food Tech Lab uh, which will implement a collaborative um, Iberian research uh, uh, on food innovation agenda and aimed at creating economic and social value in the northern regions of Portugal, Galiza and Castilla and Leão. And future projects will include the International Research Center for the Atlantic Air Center and also the Iberian Center for Research and Energy Storage. Uh, we also signed a common memorandum related to the prevention of domestic violence and violence against human, uh, also signed in the last, uh, in the last uh, summit. Um, Por favor, and Isabel, uh, finalizando... it is very important because uh, defining the creation of a cross-border cooperation network between organizations that support victims of violence against women and domestic violence as a priority. And it aims to improve information on care and concealing resources and protection orders and the coordination of social services for victims uh, of gender-based violence. Uh, we also developed a multi-annual sustainability strategy for cross-border tourism and a common cultural agenda. This is also uh, very important. We are working on revitalization of villages um, where we, we, we organized a common meeting of vid, uh, uh, village, villages uh, when, where uh, we have the opportunity to uh, present ongoing projects and projects to be implemented, uh, focus on the development and revitalization of cross-border villages. Uh, I would also uh, like to highlight the rural campus. Uh, the, the common memorandum was also signed between Portugal and Spain to promote uh, internships for higher education students in cross-border regions with their population problems 
fostering their cultural, emotional and work connection to these territories. Um, and uh, it, it is a very good example that is being carried out uh, in, in the border and with very good results in the Spanish, in the Spanish uh, side. And once more, I would like to congratulate Paco Boya for this excellent work. Uh, we are also working on common bilingual intercultural border schools. Um, and uh, also we had the opportunity to create a common Spain-Portugal cross-border cooperation network focused uh, on the development of cooperation mechanisms and exchange of good practices with the aim of improving citizens' quality of life economic and social development and the creation of opportunities uh, contributing to responding to specific and common challenges such as aging and the population. And recently we created the Iberian Economic and Social Center, uh, jointly created uh, between Portugal and Spain in the city of Guarda, uh, an Iberian skill center in the area of social economy uh, and an initiative budgeted at 10 million uh, euros and financed through the recovery and resilience plan. Just to, to finish, um, we also have uh, together with this common strategy, a specific program, program in Portugal devoted to the valorization of inland territories, the border, uh, the cross-border territories, focused on uh, stimulating the mobility of people to these territories through uh, tax benefits, mobility programs, uh, a creation of a national network for co-working, and remote work. Uh, we have also uh, been supporting job creation, mainly highly, well, highly qualified uh, jobs, also stimulating private investment through uh, innovative production, entrepreneurship, qualification and internationalization of our small medium enterprises also stimulating network and joint collaboration between academy and companies with specific uh, calls uh, and programs. And we devoted to this program more than 6 billion euros and uh, had the opportunity to create already more than 34,000 direct jobs in a small medium territories in the, in the cross-border. Bueno, muchas gracias. Yo creo que ha quedado pues, muy bien reflejada la política pública que nos contaba Isabel Ferreira con múltiples actuaciones y en línea con lo que Janet nos decía al principio de la importancia de la cooperación transfronteriza This is in line with the cross-border cooperation between the different institutions. I would like you to give a big round of applause to Marco, Jean, and Isabel. We're going to move on to our next next part of the session, and I would like to call up to the stage Marco Ross, a member of the. Alejandra European del Río, Partner, Directora General de Alejandra del Río, General Director of the Unlock Cooperation, and Coordinator of the ANSI Lombardia Department in Europe. Adelante. Yes. Please take a seat. Yes. Bueno, y vamos a. Vamos a comenzar ¿no? esta, esta etapa, este, este diálogo. Eh, antes Part of our dialogue, una I que me you a Luis uh, para hablar en italiano, para que pueda disfrutar el reminder, uh, bueno, pues, that Matteo Luigi will be speaking in Italian for those of you who might need translation. 
If we have a look at any of the main newspapers in Spain, they might find a new story saying that the national healthcare system is warning about uh, a large number of people on the verge of retirement and the lack of resources. So this is one more element that adds complexity. We're talking about uh, public policies that tries to give a response to a problem, a depopulation, which is also immersed in many other problems. And this is why we're talking about public policies, because they tackle complex problems, problems that linger over time and that are sometimes difficult to deal with. There must be a responsibility on the part of the ministries. The Spanish government went from uh, 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 acting on uh, those municipalities losing population to uh, putting in place a new uh, series of uh, actions. And I remember uh, when they put in place the delegation for the demographic challenge. It was a governance structure that basically it was just to say uh, the Council of Ministers in Spain had a special office or department to promote public policies to counter uh, the demographic challenge. So having a government taking a decision to devote their energies and efforts and even devote or create a small uh, council of ministers working on specifically on uh, the demographic challenge, I think it's a great step ahead. And it also translated into something physical and real. It was a plan made up by 130 measures that uh, dynamized and uh, used almost 10 billion euros with good execution. This is important for managers, of course, and which has served as the basis to try and develop further this policy. I think we can start now. Marco, you are part of the European Parliament and you have a good overview of the entire issue of the demographic challenge. How do you think we can contribute to improving the situation the situation in small and medium-sized cities, which appears to be the big step for the next legislation period in Spain? Thank you, Eloy. And I would also like to thank the Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge for having uh, organized this uh, event. Actually, the General Director, Juana Lopez, it is a pleasure to be part of this uh, event, which I think has been uh, has taken place in, a, in right in time. Uh, we uh, have been seeing how the European Commission, the Committee of the Regions, the Economic and Social Committee are debating and discussing about the future of the cohesion policy that must uh, come for the period 2028-2034. And we are also witnessing a moment where we have been coexisting for the three last years, uh, we have been how the cohesion policies uh, actually do coexist with the Next Generation Fund. And I think it is the right time to reflect on how small and middle-sized uh, towns and cities can provide and contribute and be useful uh, in the fight uh, against depopulation across the European Union. If we talk about the policies that are being developed at European level, I believe that the main tool we're inviting depopulation is the European Union's cohesion policy. And this policy in the future that we are now discussing we all know the diagnosis, uh, and we know that uh, there will be some threats. There might be some discourses going against the cohesion policy. The people who believe that it is just a waste of resources, uh, this is a mistake. We know that the cohesion policy benefits everyone. The difficulties that administration has when it comes to applying this cohesion policy and how it has become a kind of uh, a blurred situation 
where any unforeseen crisis has led to people wanting to take the funds of this uh, cohesion policy. So there are many challenges. And uh, these can be grouped together in four large blocks. The cohesion policy needs to contribute to the ecologic and uh, uh, technology transition. Uh, but there are other challenges. It must contribute to uh, fighting depopulation and favoring and contributing to that uh, demographic challenge. Another one is the flexibilization. I think small and medium sized towns need a lot of flexibility still. And finally, improving governance and the incorporation of uh, small uh, and medium sized towns and territories uh, for better governance of the cohesion policy as a whole. If we talk about the strategic framework across the European Union, we see a large. Uh, uh, an important problem with what we are calling the region on the risk of uh, development, which account for 16% of the population across the EU. And there are 36 more regions that are at risk of falling into this category. And this is part of a global framework where we estimate that the EU population will be decreased by 35 million people between the year 20, uh, 2100. And uh, we know this, we know this will happen, and we have heard this previously today and also yesterday, I'm sure. This generates uh, a lot of pressure on those territories that are being emptied we heard about España vaciada, the hello to Spain, and it's all, always related to the lack of the services and infrastructures that small, medium-sized cities and towns suffer from. Uh, citizens seek a better quality of life and they emigrate uh, nearer the larger functional uh, metropolitan areas. And in turn, this implies uh, uh, the loss of uh, a lot of talent. There has been a resolution by the European Parliament that will be uh, voted next week about how to make the most of uh, the uh, European regions. And I invite you all to watch and follow this debate on uh, about this initiative by the European Commission, which is, I think, fundamental in the year, in the framework of this uh, European year of capacities. And uh, against all this, the most important thing is territorial development, not considering cities and towns as isolated entities, but rather as entities linked to a territory. And this is the most important political framework we have ahead of us. The common uh, provision uh, re regulation also develops chapter two of uh, Title Three. Uh, with a whole chapter devoted to uh, territorial management and integration. We all know the uh, territorial strategies that can be developed, which are not very many today. It is basically the ITIs and the participative uh, local developments and any other action, but that any other action has not yet been defined. And they all have the goal of uh, complying with uh, the uh, goal five of the cohesion policy. Up until now, in pre prior uh, offices, government, they always prioritized uh, questions and issues around uh, cities. And they had an urban agenda in place to comply with. They worked around the integrated uh, sustainable development in the cities, the European Urban Initiative. There is even 8% of the funds, of the cohesion funds, devoted specifically for urban policies. We have very many reports for the parliaments in 2013, 15, 18 on urban policy. But again, we must not uh, separate urban from territorial. And let me conclude with something very important. We are currently working, and I am the spokesperson. It was presented in the Commission a month ago, and now we have uh, had the amendments, and we will shortly present the final report on the implementation across the EU of the uh, Territorial Agenda 2030. This is the key instrument for uh, 
and adequate planning of the territories, which include small and medium-sized cities on the risk of depopulation and on the risk of development. We have noted how this agenda has not been uh, promoted sufficiently, and it, now it is, a, it is a time to promote it. And we have given about 10 to 12 ideas, but I will be brief and I will just not go over all of them. We are demanding the European Commission to create a framework of reference for the Territorial Agenda 2030 and to consider the actual goals and objectives of the TA 2030 with funding of uh, the cohesion policy. We have also requested a series of indicators to link the FEDA funds to the territorial agenda of each particular territory. We are also demanding a strategy for the uh, uh, allocation of those uh, subsidies. There is a global agreement among the large groups. We are demanding a percentage. We're not saying how much just devoted to the territorial agenda and also uh, the creation of a, of a methodology, a series of indicators, the increase of the use of the cities, uh, more implementation of the pilot projects. We have just heard uh, about some of them right now, uh, a guide uh, with criteria for the drafting of programs and even for the territorial agenda to have the necessary legal fin and financial instruments uh, of its own. In short, we are demanding a more active framework of development of a document that, although it shares the same philosophy of the urban agenda, has not yet been just as uh, developed as the urban agenda. And lastly, better and larger dissemination of the strategies, because very often citizens are unaware of uh, some of the things that have happened in their municipalities. Uh, and how they come from the drafting of an uh, integrated territorialized agenda or a participative process or territorial strategies as part of the cohesion policy. Very interesting, Marcos. We, in the General Secretary for the Demographic Challenge, when we uh, start working on some of our actions, such as a call that will be resolved shortly, we had some advantage, some competitive advantage, because we have already introduced some of the elements of the Territorial Agenda 2030. We shall now continue making or insisting on something very, very important, which is the network. The network, which is a concept which, for a general director, working on regional and local cooperation, I believe will be, it will be very important to have a network of more than 8,000 uh, councils in Spain. The local council is the office so to speak, that governs and rules over a municipality. I think it also happens in Italy, doesn't it? Uh, there is what some expert call infra-municipality, which can, however, become an opportunity. The more than 8,000 municipalities in Spain can also be an opportunity to take the public policies and use them as a vehicle to, uh, to, 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 to pass on those uh, policies. Do you agree with that, Alejandra? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Let me give you Marcos' microphone. Does that work now? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank ESPON and particularly the Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition and Territorial Policy for having invited me to take part in this uh, event. I am very grateful because we are overwhelmed by the different priorities we have every day and the emergencies uh, that sometimes also come up. And very often we forget that there are many people with uh, a lot of talent and there are many issues where you are working and it is a great pleasure to have the opportunity to listen to them in person and to reflect with them on such key issues. Since I am also aware of time, I will put my uh, clock on right now. And uh, the issue that we're discussing today of multi-level governance and public services, uh, let me just say that in Spain, the case has been very particular in the last decades because we live in a country that uh, about four years, 40 years ago, uh, 
did an accelerated and asymmetrical decentralization, which was really complex, with the creation of the community, the autonomous communities or regions in our country. But just after a few years, following the creation of those autonomous regions, we joined the European Union. It was, was then called the European Economic Community. And we also had to do an integration process. So we decentralized our competencies, the resources, the staff, and at the same time, the integration into certain European policies. Uh, that's okay. And uh, as I was saying, the integration into um, European institutions that have been evolving by taking on new competencies competencies and new challenges in recent years. So we have created in Spain a whole administrative ecosystem that's very complex, very interesting also, politically very much focused on the debate on the competencies of the different economic autonomous communities, which is something that has taken the lead in uh, the uh, political debate in Spain in recent decades. Uh, today, I think they are debating about this issue. And sometimes we neglected small and medium-sized cities and towns. We take, took it for granted because the councils were there. They continued to be there. And we took it for granted that the real challenge, as far as the government uh, is concerned, that the challenge was one for the state, working with the regions, the community, the communities, and with the European Union. But what about the cities in this whole this new administration scenario? Now, uh, there are many interlocutors and many different levels of government, whereas before there was just one, the central government. So the answer is not an easy one. Indeed, we have more than 8,000 municipalities and councils in Spain, but the large cities can actually stand to the challenge because they have the necessary teams and resources in place. They have the necessary budgets and they have the capacity to face. Eloy referred to the calls. I also do calls uh, with a series of indicators, etc. If, if we have a mayor here in the room that may have requested a European fund or a fund from the government of Spain, it is extraordinarily complex as a process. For larger cities, it is doable, but for small and medium-sized cities, it's really complicated, really complex and difficult. We have uh, effected certain legal reforms that have made the whole process even more complex. The uh, regionalization and sustainability of the budgets for uh, councils has even made things more complicated from a management standpoint. I wouldn't like just to moan about this and uh, weep, but rather focus on what can be done to solve this, taking into account the uh, principle of proximity. We have the Treaty of Lisbon, we have the uh, necessary treaties and agreements, uh, and the competence should always be closer to uh, the citizens or as close as possible. But what can you do for a uh, mayor of a medium or size or a small city that has specific problem and that sometimes has to respond on behalf of the city, the autonomous region, their country, and sometimes before the actual European entities. Uh, the cities themselves are organizing. I was at a Euro Cities Forum bringing together small and medium sized cities which are claiming for a revision and a review of the European treaties so that they can have a direct voice in Brussels before the European Union. It might not be an easy task, but uh, I would say that this is the time to do this because we're just on the verge of new European elections, a new commission, and we are also immersed in a process for a, a growing European Union. Uh, we have heard about a committee of the regions and a potential meeting there. And I think it is actually up to the cities to take that step ahead. And in Spain, we have been uh, working for better integration of the cities in uh, sector-based conferences uh, which in Spain are the forum for the coordination between the central government and the 
autonomous region. This is how it has been established, but uh, in recent years, we have been allowing and also inviting the participation of cities in this fora so that they can be heard. There is, for instance, a sector-based conference for European funds, so it appears clear that the representation of cities should be part of this uh, sector-based conference, although the legal framework does not foresee this. We still need to go through some legal reforms. Today, we are in, immersed in a, an appointment uh, process for a new government, and there is an agreement between the Socialist Party and SUMAR, which also includes a series of uh, legal reforms that are necessary and that need to be completed so that small and medium-sized cities, those with a lesser degree of population, can cooperate better and can join forces. Both Juana and Eloy know a lot about this. And finally, we have digitalization. And in terms of territorial policy, we observe that digitalization is key. Through the funds of the recovery plan, we have invested about 400 million euros in digitalizing uh, local entities and authorities in Spain with uh, subsidies aimed specifically at those smaller towns of less than 50,000 and less than 20,000 inhabitants. And this uh, digitalization was initially more uh, uh, aimed at uh, municipal services, for public services, for swifter services. Uh, this would have a great impact on smaller municipalities with a population issue, where obviously you need to ensure the provision of this type of services. But through digitalization, we have also been detecting well, we designed a program that left room for a lot of autonomy so that the actual towns and cities, their councils, could say what they needed, what they wanted, within certain limitations, of course, but what they wanted to digitalize, what the priorities were in that regard. And we realized that digitalization is first and foremost allowing us to have better statistical data. This very week, we will be launching a call, a bidding process for the digitalization of municipal registries. Uh, in Spain, the Padron, the register, is that list where citizens uh, actually uh, get registered and which, uh, believe it or not, is still do, done by hand in many uh, places in Spain. Information is not then uh, shared in real time, but rather it takes a while for the information to be compiled and shared. So uh, these small councils are lacking the tools for this digitalization to be a reality. And something else that digitalization is allowing us to do is for smaller entities to share their information more, also the provincial deputations. This is another level of governance in Spain, a grouping smaller entities uh, being part of the uh, same province to be uh, together, to, to, to act together. And we actually realized that some of these entities do share these uh, digital resources. We saw that uh, some requests were exactly the same. When you get a request from Albacete here in Castilla Lanza, from the Basque country in the north of Spain, they uh, were exactly the same. And we realized that they were sharing their programs, which we think is really interesting and which also helps us create scale economies. And finally, digitalization is also allowing us to listen to them better. We have new tools available that allow the government to listen to uh, small and medium-sized cities. And we can receive the input and develop new tools, uh, always taking into account the perspective. Uh, this is uh, very much still in the early stages, and we still do not quite see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it has a lot of potential in the long run. Thank you. Thank you for keeping with the time. We shall now proceed with the last uh, talk uh, by Matteo Luigi Bianchi, who's, uh, who will be speaking Italian. So do get your translation kits ready. Uh, 
Can somebody bring a translation device? Uh, it is. It is. A, do you need? Y preparamos sus slides. No necesitan. Vale. No necesitan. Vale. Pues adelante. It's not really necessary to wear any device. Grazie. Grazie. Buongiorno. Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Matteo Bianchi Bianchi Lombardia. Lombardia is the National Association of the Italian Councils for the region of Lombardy. Uh, we represent some 1,500 councils in the region. We are part of the Italian territory, obviously, and today I wanted to uh, share the Italian experience in uh, the uh, in in, in uh, the areas, the uh, national strategy that has uh, been known as Lombardy. Uh, the strategy uh, for this uh, internal areas is backed by agenda for counter acting, countering uh, exodus, how to attract new inhabitants and companies and economies in those peripheral in inner areas. The national strategy for inner uh, areas, well, originally it has some 4,000 councils. Uh, councils in it, uh, we have around 8,000 in total across Italy, just the same as uh, in Spain. And they actually account for about a million inhabitants who are on the risk of depopulation. Nobody in this initial strategy had four areas, such as uh, classified as in inner areas, for eight, 85,000 inhabitants. There's, uh, Counter Exodus strategy was introduced in the region by individualizing 14 inner areas with 488 municipalities, 19 mountain communities, and 1 million inhabitants across the Lombardy region, which uh, in which region the total population is about 10 million. In this map, which we can see here, we see the inner areas, which are the objects of this strategy, and we can see that they are scattered around the entire territory of Lombardy. Anche Lombardy, as I said, is an entity that represents the municipalities around Lombardy, but it also assists the councils and the institutions of the Lombardy region that determines or defines the objectives of the general policy for the development of the territory and which works with different stakeholders for the development of research activities. In this slide, you can see the police which is the Society of the Lombardy Region that works on research and also the Milano Polytechnical School, with which we cooperate often in the development of research pertaining to inner areas. The three phases of activities in Anci Lombardia can be summarized in the definition of the local strategies and the implementation of the local projects, uh, monitoring and final reporting of what has been done. As I was saying, the 488 municipalities have their own particularities, uh, smaller towns are always peculiar and particular. In these realities, we find situations that I would like to highlight here. Most of these uh, towns are in mountainous regions, uh, in the Alps and the pre-Alps regions. And very often, these are inner regions that uh, overlap with organizations that already have uh, 
uh, different uh, administrations, but there are also sorts of uh, realities. There are places that do not belong to mountainous regions, but rather on the plains in uh, the south uh, of Lombardy, next to or uh, near the Rupo. In these realities where there are no congregation forms in the mountain regions, we have used uh, different association tools and resources such as consortiums, local action groups, in order to uh, join different municipalities together. And in certain situations, the actual municipalities have established a series of tax uh, taxes for the creation of such congregation and for the launching of strategies and activities. This is the slide that represents uh, shows the different uh, inner areas being part of the Lombardy region, which have this uh, particular uh, peculiar situation. Those mountain uh, communities is uh, uh, 23 in total, out of which 19 belong to inner areas. Very quickly, uh, here we mentioned the Oltrepo Mantovan region. This is a plain region which has uh, a problem related to depopulation, such as uh, in Lomelina, which is in the Pavia region. And in all these realities that I just went over, as we uh, are talking about something that's very specific, where a lot of uh, assistance and competence is needed, the National Association of Councils of Lombardy supports municipalities to go down that path. I shall finish now. And just as the prior speakers have said, the uh, cohesion policies, the direct uh, European funds are all arguments that are really important for the development of the inner areas and the rural areas indeed. As uh, councils in Lombardy, we want this to continue and we want to continue to support our territories also through the development of their competencies. This year is the year of competencies and we need competence uh, centers so that the staff of those uh, municipalities or those councils, but also the administrators and managers know where they can uh, take the municipalities they represent. I strongly support the local autonomies because the first institutional level is particularly that one, the councils, and they need to function better in order to better support uh, citizens, uh, better serve citizens, which is uh, as uh, what, what the Lisbon Treaty actually is about. But I think these uh, municipalities and these or principles of autonomy cannot look away from uh, what has to be done together with the rest of uh, the municipalities, the councils. We need to build ways to support the more than 1,500 municipalities so that they can have the necessary resources to join forces and work together, because otherwise there will be nothing to work towards. In the time prior to COVID, the European Union developed a large number of important activities on urban areas with the creation of the urban agenda, for instance, and the post-pandemic era has shown the importance of the development of the rural areas. And I am very happy to hear more and more about this way forward. The local entities, and let me just finalize now, uh, I think they need to resort more to the European uh, resources. We have heard uh, a lot about the future of Europe in the regional council as part of the Italian system. There is an open debate going on that takes, uh, as an example, the Spanish model, Spanish example the distribution of competencies from the central state towards uh, the regions. And I believe that uh, since the 80% of the national legislation derives uh, from Europe, I think it should uh, go from the national state, from the central administration to the territory, and it's important for the regional entities to have direct contact 
with the decision-making powers in Brussels, in Europe, so that the uh, circle of autonomy can, or the loop of autonomy can be closed entirely for the interest of the regional autonomy for the region I represent and also the, in the interest of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mateo, for having Thank you, We are wrapping this session with us now. Um, I hope that you have had the opportunity of uh, getting to many conclusions after our speakers. Uh, uh, we have talked about uh, the territorial aspect and uh, in terms of the physical aspects, in, we have to say that we have achieved in Spain a full digital connectivity in the whole of the territory. And uh, following that initiative, or uh, to, to see this initiative, I would like to invite you to visit the website of the Ministry of Ecological Transition and uh, Demographic Challenge. There is something that we have been pushing. The General uh, Secretary has been pushing this. Uh, the Centers of Territorial Innovation is the initiative, and I think it's worth uh, for you to have a look at them. <laughs>